Welcome one and all as we come together to worship on this very blustery and snowy morning. We're all snuggled at home because it of course is dangerous to be out. This is a gathering of both uh, Cochrane Street United Church and St. James United Church and so we're so glad that we are launching uh, our partnership today as we begin Lent. This beautiful time for us to pause, to meditate, to reflect, to align ourselves with Jesus and his teaching about the reign of God. As we come together, we do so lighting our candle. The light of Christ is with us here, now, in this place. In Christ, although we are many, we are one. Let our hospitality towards each other reflect God's love. And may the peace of Christ be with us all. Now, as we come together in prayer, each Sunday of Lent, the intention is to have a meditative time listening to an aspect of nature, an element of nature. So let us center ourselves now as we listen to the sound of the earth. It is reflected in a series of footsteps across various surfaces. Let us pause now and center ourselves listening to God within us and present in creation. Let us pray. Creative and creating God, we come together in stillness, 
opening our hearts to your presence within us, between us, within and beyond all of your creation as well. Be with us in these Lenten days as we journey together in the companionship of Jesus, your beloved Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now for our learning together time each of the Sundays of Lent, we're going to reflect on some of the devotions that are taking, uh, taken out of Act Fast. That is the Lenten devotional book prepared this year by the United Church of Canada. Uh, the, each of the excerpts that will be taken will be written, the ones written by me, uh, which uh, is a happy coincidence, I guess. Uh, the first one, though, I just wanted to share is about, again, it's about the earth. And we begin with this thought from uh, the book of Proverbs. The Lord created me the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Before the mountains had been shaped before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields of the world first bits of soil. Now, the writer of Proverbs is speaking about wisdom, but he's also echoing what I consider uh, a fundamental teaching about the earth itself. He speaks about mountains and soil and fields and earth. Have you ever thought about how our rocky planet became such a home of many organisms especially all the life forms that inhabited, including us as humans. Now, according to soil scientists, it all happens through weathering. That's the interactive process that slowly turns the rock into pliable humus that can sustain a forest. It's possible because nothing on our planet acts alone. Over time, through the power of wind and rain, heat and cold, rock breaks down. Organisms play their part as well as first lichens and then mosses and then sedges and grasses all slowly break down the rock into pieces. And as these first plants die, their organic matter enriches this new soil. Fungi, microbes, other organisms also enable larger plants to grow, which in turn provide more organic matter and the soil becomes richer and richer over time. I find that really amazing. And all because not even a rock can act on its own. Weathering and soil creation speak to how interrelated all the processes of life on our planet are. Each and everything interacts with each and everything around it. Everything is kin. The principle of kinship extends even to God, as we're told in Proverbs, that wisdom is present in all of this. Wisdom being that idea of God that gave Christians a first inspiration around the Trinity. Now we forget this interaction, we forget our kinship. So much of what happens in our world we know is because we stand apart. We stand apart from the earth, we stand apart from each other, we stand apart from God. We mine the rocks, we burn fossil fuels, we use up the soil and pollute the water in the sky, all because of that sense of separation. But it doesn't need to be like this, does it? Wisdom, the lights and all that God made, and we can delight in it as well. Now, one way we can do that is with a bit of a prayer practice that I invite you to do sometime this week, is to make a rock garden. And I'm going to need to share my screen to show you how to do that. Let 
that's not what I want. Sorry about that. There we go. Do you see that? Now what I'm suggesting is we create a garden, not with plants, but with soil and sand and gravel and rock. Being conscious of the various textures that you experience, how some are hard and some are pliable, some are soft. And just make a pleasing arrangement. And as you do that, pause both for gratitude of your creativity but also with gratitude for the gift of the earth so let us now be attentive to the readings for today. Our first reading comes from the end of the story of Noah. The waters of the great flood have receded and Noah and his family with countless animals have now exited the ark. Let's be attentive to a reading from the book of Genesis chapter 9 verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal with you, as many as came out of the ark, I establish my covenant with you. That never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I established between me and all flesh on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is Psalm 25, taken from Voices United, page 752. To you, O God, I lift up my soul. To you, I lift up my soul. To you, O God, I lift up my soul. My God, in you I trust. Let me be put to shame, nor let my foes gloat over me. Let none who waited for you be ashamed. Let them be ashamed who wantonly break faith. Show me your ways. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O God and of your steadfast love, for they are as old as time. Do not remember the sins and offenses of my youth. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for your goodness sake, O God. For you are upright and good, O God. Therefore you show the path to those who go astray. You guide the humble to do what is right and teach the lowly the way. All your ways are loving and sure for those who keep your covenant and commandments. To you, O God, I lift up my soul. To you, I lift up my soul.
Our gospel reading takes us back to the beginning of the year as we hear of Jesus' baptism. This places his temptation, his testing in the wilderness in context, suggesting that he was led there in response to his mystical experience in the Jordan River. This is a reading from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. At that time, Jesus came from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the place where John was. John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. When Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. The Holy Spirit came down on him like a dove. A voice came from heaven and said, You are my son and I love you. I am very pleased with you. Then the Spirit sent Jesus into the desert alone. He was in the desert for 40 days and was there with the wild animals. While he was in the desert, he was tested by Satan. Then angels came and took care of him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into the Galilee and preached the good news from God. Jesus said, the right time has come. The reign of God is near. Repent, change your heart to lives and believe the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our final reading is a translation of a poem by Jalal Adin Muhammad Rumi, most known popularly as just Rumi. This Muslim poet and mystic was born in the 13th century of what is now Western Afghanistan. This poem is entitled, The Water We Seek. The eye or the spirit that focuses on the transient falls on its face wherever it goes. Someone who focuses on the distance without knowledge may seem far but just as we do in a dream. Asleep on the bank of a river, lips parched, you dream you are running towards water. In the distance, you see the water of your desire, and caught by your seeing, you run toward it. In the dream, you boast, I am the one whose heart can see through walls. Yet. Every step carries you further away toward the perilous mirage. For the moment you dreamed, you set out, you created the distance. And from that which had been near to you, many set out on a journey that leads them farther away from their goal. The intuitive claims of the sleeper are a fantasy. You too are sleepy. But for God's sake, if you must sleep, sleep on the way of God. And maybe some other seeker on the way will awaken you from your fantasies and slumber. No matter how subtle the sleeper's thoughts becomes, his dreams will not guide him home. Whether the sleeper's thought is twofold or threefold, it is error multiplying error. This is a word of wisdom. Thanks be to God. Relationships. It's what today's readings are all about and it's what Lent is about too. Because if we're attentive, relationships are what God's reign is about. Relationships which extend in ever-widening circles to embrace loved ones, friends, acquaintances, strangers, even enemies, extending even beyond that to other creatures and the earth itself. Lent is given as an opportunity to reflect on our tendency to stand apart from each other, to forget these relationships and instead to realign our lives with God's reign, 
to realign them so that hostility to others is transformed into hospitality. Now, to live into God's reign, we need to start with our relationship with God. And this relationship is echoed in our gospel as we're brought back to a story we associate not with Lent, but with the Sundays after Epiphany, when Jesus is baptized. And there he experiences God's claim on him as beloved child. I like that Lent begins here this year because it grounds the season as both a time of preparation for those who may be seeking baptism and as an invitation for those who have been baptized to reflect on the significance of baptism in their lives. I think it's why we hear another water story. The first one we heard went after the flood, God covenants with Noah when God establishes his relationship with Noah and Noah's family and with all of life. It uses imagery from Genesis, if we're attentive to it, as God brings forth the world from water and as part of that creation forms all of creation, all of the animals and forms humans in God's image and likeness. It's a reminder that our most fundamental relationship is with God. God, who is both our source and our goal. If we'd had an Ash Wednesday service, but of course it was canceled because of the weather, people would have received a cross of ash on their forehead. And people are often told in that moment, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Now, many of us experience it as a reminder of our mortality, the finite nature of our lives, yes. But it refers to the second creation story as well as God forms the first humans out of dust. It's a reminder that it is from God that we come into being and it is to God that we will return. That union with God is our core identity, something we share with Jesus. And yet, how often do we lose sight of this in our lives, seeking that relationship that relationship of fulfillment in many places other than where God is. Augustine famously wrote of this in his Confessions. This is what he says. Late have I loved you, beauty ancient and new, and see you were within and I was outside. I sought you outside. And in my unlovely state, I plunged into all the lovely things that you made. Augustine was seeking outside of himself for God who is within. And Rumi hints at this. He hints that we dream that we are seeking water, an image of God, what is actually right beside us how deluded we can become. But Lent is an opportunity to pause and nurture this most essential of relationships. And the traditions associated with this time are rooted in reorienting ourselves to God. Now, many people fast or they give something up in this time. It's not about punishing ourselves. Rather, it's about reorienting ourselves to God. Every time I feel a pang of hunger, every time I want to eat some chocolate, every time I'm itching to play a video game or to check my social media, whatever it is we may have given up, we are reminded of God. Now, as we recall in the great commandment, we not only love God with all that we are, but we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so as we're redirected back to God, we're also re back, redirected back to our neighbors. The tradition of fasting is tied to another Lenten tradition, that of giving alms. Because the money saved when we fast or don't eat chocolate or don't use electricity to play a game or check our social media, that is intended to be used for others. 
It's why Jesus realized that his connection to God as God's beloved child was not enough. He went into the wilderness to ponder what being beloved meant, but then returned to Galilee where he called others to turn to God and invited them to turn to God, not by themselves, but in community, seeing as Jesus will go on to call disciples to share his ministry with him. Again, it's all about relationships, but those relationships need to be life-giving, which is also thematically, I think, why Jesus was in the wilderness. His time there echoes yet another water story, that of the Israelites escaping enslavement by crossing through the sea. Then they spend 40 years in the wilderness, just like Jesus spends 40 days there. There in the wilderness, they learned a new way of being with each other, not the domination model they learned in Egypt, but a cooperative model where they share with each other, where they only use as much as they need, where they work together to solve issues before appealing to a higher authority. Now, it's a struggle to put into practice, as we'll discover in later Sundays, but... They were testing a different way of relating to each other. And Jesus likewise was being tested. Like any of us, he was tempted to revert to the ways of power, to doubt that fundal relationship he had in God's love. And out of that doubt, to use relationships to put himself ahead of others. But Jesus came not to do that. He came instead to preach God's reign where mutually life-giving relationships are the key. Something that Joan Chittister, uh, some, an author I really like, points to as the point of Lent. This is what she writes. Lent is to open ourselves to life. When we rend our hearts, we break them open to things that we are refusing perhaps to consider. We've refused perhaps for years to even think about renewing old commitments that we've allowed to go to dust, spending time with our children or visiting our parents. We've closed ourselves perhaps to the thought of reconciling with old friends whom we have hurt. We've refused to put the effort into reviving old spiritual practices. Lent instead, though, is a time to let life in again. And this refers to all of life. Again, we look to Jesus in the wilderness, and who is he there with? He's there with the animals. Again, it's a creation connection. Jesus presented as a new Adam. In Genesis 2, God brings to the human, to Adam, all of the animals to see if they can be helpmates. And while none would be what the human needed, the wisdom in the text is they each have the potential to be, not as resources, not as something to be used, but as companions, creatures given a name, each having their own identity. And the Noah story, again, points to this, because God's covenant is made with all creatures, not just Noah and his family. That all of life is connected to God and multiple relationships is something else to ponder in this reflective season. Again, using the example of fasting, as we fast, we consider more what we eat. We take stock of our relationship with food. It makes us pause to consider how is it produced and what is its impact on our world. As you can see, the readings are all about relationships. Lent is all about relationships. The reign of God is all about relationships. We're given this season to pause, take stock of who we are, how we're doing with God, how we're doing with one another and with the creatures with whom we share the earth. We may be enmeshed in a world that is more hostile than hospitable at times. 
that uses relationships rather than nurtures them. But thankfully, we have these six weeks to ponder, to seek renewal, to ask forgiveness if need be. So friends, let us then enter into this holy time of fasting, prayer, study, and almsgiving as we nurture relationships with each other and with God. Amen. Now you likely notice that we didn't begin the service with a prayer of confession. I like to use the tradition of various West African cultures who teach that it's premature to confess one's sin before you've heard the words of the Bible. God's word speaks to our hearts, has spoken to our hearts, and now helps us to see what it is that we need to release in that spirit then. Let us seek God's mercy. Let us pray. Creating God, we give thanks for this world. You are all around us in the wonder of your creatures, yet we often end up separating ourselves from creation and treating the world not as a gift in itself, but just as a means to wealth. Healing God, bring us to wholeness. You are always with us, drawing near in Jesus who came to reconcile and make new. Yet we hold back in his work, staying in our tribes, separating ourselves in silos, referring division over the call to bring peace to our world. Healing God, bring us to wholeness. We affirm in our faith that you, O God, are at work in us and others by your spirit. Yet we seem to trust in you only in as much as our prayers are answered, questioning your love when life takes an unexpected turn. Healing God, bring us to wholeness. And let us pause now as we call to mind other places where we need God's healing and forgiveness. Healing God, bring us to wholeness. So friends, though we often try to go it alone, God is still with us, walking near us in Christ, strengthening us to follow his path of love. Through his grace and forgiveness, we are brought to wholeness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, as we continue to pray, 
We can't just pray seeking forgiveness, but we need to name the concerns of our hearts and worries about the world, releasing them too into God's love and mercy. Let us continue to pray. Holy One, both our source and our goal, we thank you for this holy season. A time to pause and to reflect on our relationships, to consider how we can live out more faithfully Christ's call in our lives. We pray for your blessing, our hearts open to your grace. As we reflect on our relationships, we pray for those near and dear to us. For those who are hurting or worried, those who are sick or undergoing surgery, those with whom we may be estranged. We pray for healing in body, heart, spirit, and mind, for mercy, understanding, and forgiveness. We pray too for our church family, especially as Cochrane Street United and St. James United begin our partnership. For God's blessing as we grow in our relationship and together support our community. And there is much to pray for as we consider our community, with a high cost of living, concerns about health, a shortage of housing, especially as winter brings its freezing fury. We pray that there may be helping hands and listening ears to support any and all who are in need. And this is a time of worry for many as we look at our country as well as our neighbor to the south. In recent days, there's been violence on both sides of the border. We pray that we may find ways to extend more kindness, to be people who offer hospitality rather than those who stoke greater hostility. And we need that beyond this continent too, as the war in Gaza continues and the IDF threatened action in Rafa, as Ukraine faces setbacks and its defense against Russia, as Armenia and Azerbaijan renew fighting, as there is conflict in so many other parts of the world, we pray for peace. And we need peace, not just for our humans, but for our planet. As we rightly fret over a destabilizing world, we shift focus from another fight that needs our effort. Creating God, may we find ways to come together in building a more sustainable and nurture, nature nurturing world. One that recognizes that connections we share with each other. We live these many circles of relationships with you, O oh God, and seek your guidance and strength in nurturing them in these holy days and beyond. With these and many needs on our hearts, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to go forth from this time of worship, we pray a prayer of guidance. This is a tradition at Cochrane Street United, slightly adapted in honor of the partnership that Cochrane Street and St. James are entering into. We pray a prayer for guidance. Holy God, dreamer of dreams, we offer the partnership of Cochrane Street United Church and St. James United Church to you. We are your people, this is your church. We come to you seeking your guidance, your purpose, your vision. Align our will with yours, so that we will be willing to do whatever it takes to carry out your plan. We ask you to break through in new ways in our church. Show us the great ministry you have in store for us. 
Help us dream your dreams. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, giving us the vision, boldness, and confidence to do all that you call us to do. Amen. And so as we go from here in this time of self-reflection, may we be blessed in also knowing Jesus more deeply. May we follow along the path he has walked before us, arriving at Easter in a spirit of renewed hope and joy. Amen.